Uh, welcome everybody to this security and compliance webinar, uh, really focusing on a lot of the cool things that got announced at Microsoft Ignite. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Vlad Katrinescu, uh, Office Apps and Services. Uh, basically, I love SharePoint, uh, MVP from Montreal, Canada. And I'm joined today, first of all, by my co-host and good friend, Drew Madelong. How are you doing, Drew? Great. It's good to continue this, this Ignite recap. And this is one I've been uh, pretty excited about in security and compliance. So uh, my name is Drew Madelong. I am an Office 365 consultant uh, out kind of based in the Midwest uh, and also a fellow MVP like yourself, Vlad. And actually, I work at a company called Protivity. And I actually have the honor of bringing in one of our esteemed colleagues. Antonio, do you want to bring in your introduction? Hi, guys. Hi, Vlad and Drew. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Um, so my name is Antonio Mayo. Like Vlad and Drew, I'm also a Microsoft MVP in Office Apps and Services, um, Microsoft SharePoint MVP from a long time ago. Um, and a lot of my work focuses on security and compliance information governance, identity management, these areas that we're going to talk about today. So I'm really happy to be here with you both. Awesome. And, and I'd like to kick these off with uh, a little bit around, so you were at Ignite, right? Vlad and I were also at Ignite. Yeah. Uh, Before that, Drew, I actually want to mention what? something. You need to be careful. There's more Canadians in this <laughs> webinar now. I, Two versus I one. I thought about that. I saw that and I also <laughs> see how I put myself kind of in the middle. I should, I should I put you guys like both yeah, yeah. Never mind. Yeah. in the maple leaf. I don't know if we have any Canadian listeners today. I'm sure we do, but sure we Canada do. is definitely rocking this webinar. That is very yeah, true. I forgot to mention I mean, that I'm from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada as well. So yeah, Canadians are in the house. I mean, I think Antonio, like even with you in Ottawa and me in Wisconsin, we're still pretty close on that latitude line there. We are. Like, so technically I might be more you. north than you. You might be. You, you get as cold as we do. That's good. But it was not cold in Orlando. Oh, like that segue? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Ignite was now, we're going on over two weeks ago. Uh, so Antonio, how many Ignites have you been to now? I've been to five Ignites. I've been to all every one since it was called Ignite. Yeah. And uh, I love that conference. Ignite is my favorite conference every year. And, and so now I mean, we're talking about security and compliance and uh, what were some of the main kind of takeaways you saw? I mean, not just in security compliance. Well, I know we're going to go deep into that, but were you were in the Microsoft and Office 365 space. What were some of the things that, or maybe one or two things that you really took away that said, wow, this was, this is what made it worth it to come here. So one thing that really struck me, and this was a little different this year than from previous Ignites, um, every single presentation I went to or every single session I went to started off with a customer scenario. Like every Every um, new feature or capability or important point that was made in a presentation started off with, we have a customer that wants to do this, or we have a customer that has this issue. And I thought that was significant because, you know, it really showed us, especially in the Microsoft sessions, that Microsoft is really focused on real world scenarios and real world problems that people need, especially in the security and compliance space. So I thought that was really meaningful. I'm not sure if you saw that as well. Yeah, actually, that was, that's a very interesting thing. I haven't I didn't even think about that before, but a perfect example is uh, kind of in the OneDrive space, the request files concept. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually something that I worked and talked with Microsoft on and from a customer ask. It was a direct customer ask that kind of helped lead some of that. And the story for that was actually told in the sense of this is what you can do to meet the customer need. So I think I didn't really think about that before. That's a really good point that when you looked at the needs in the Office 365 space, it's not just what should we do or what would kind of be a cool thing. It's what do the customers, like what does the product need to evolve into to meet the needs of the different industries? Exactly. And I think where we're seeing that, Antonio, a lot is as the enterprises get bigger, mm -hmm. as you get into larger and more highly regulated industries, the ones that we work in a lot, yeah. the complexities of a highly regulated industry is a different type of customer story than it is if you're working in a, an SMB or a business that does not necessarily need that. So I think it's a really good takeaway from, from yeah, what we absolutely. saw in the sessions. Yeah, and, and I think what, what overlaps with that that makes the, the answer even more difficult to get to is you have a lot of organizations that are trying to balance that with collaboration. So keeping people productive, keeping people working effectively day to day, not slowing them down, but at the same time doing it in a secure and compliant way. 
Like those two things sometimes battle against each other, but I do see Microsoft really trying to bring a balance to those two things to the market without compromising either. So I kind of got that. That's a little more subtle point, but I got that from a lot of the information I, I gathered also. Awesome. And I, and I know when we're thinking about how these, these customers, I think a customer need is a good question to say into. One of the things I know you and I talked a lot about is when you, is Project Cortex and how that kind of came together and how that comes together in this concept of not just security and compliance, but bringing the customer story back into the product. Um, exactly. Do you want to speak for a second about what your, what was your kind of feedback or feelings from that announcement for Cortex? So I was super excited about Project Cortex. Um, as you and I have talked about a couple of times, Drew, um, when I work in the Microsoft Cloud and Office 365 and SharePoint, I like to work at scale. Like I want to see people bringing in 100,000 documents a week, a million documents, like really operating on the processes that we work in over large scales of documents and content and users. And I think Cortex really starts to get us there. Um, Cortex is bringing together um, you know, Azure Cognitive Services capabilities with the um, you know, large amounts of storage and, and abilities for managing documents and content in SharePoint and a number of other new tools and consoles so that we can actually bring in or capture large amounts of content in varying formats and then actually reason over that much content effectively. So the fact that we can use you know, AI capabilities like machine learning or machine teaching as well, because we saw both and those two things are different. Um, operate on documents and, and teach the system how to extract elements out of forms or teach the system how to extract terms and create cards that allow people to quickly see, oh, what does this acronym mean? Or, you know, a new employee onboarding, be able to quickly uh, be able to get up to speed by, by having the system learn all of this content really quickly. I think that brings a lot of um, exciting new experiences, both for um, collecting and managing knowledge in your organization, but then also reasoning over large amounts of content quickly. So super exciting, Project Cortex. And I think, and, that, and I totally agree. And that one of the things that, and I think it's a great setup that when we start talking about security and compliance here, because we're talking about big data, right? We're talking about AI and machine learning capabilities at scale. Yeah. I mean, if we look back to where the where is AI, where is machine learning and this kind of AI concepts the most necessary? It's in security, right? It has to be. Mm -hmm. the The trends that we're seeing, it's it's interesting when we're kind of preparing for this. You could throw stats out. We could do an hour just of stats on Agreed. risk and security. Yeah. And the bigger one is basically, you need to have security in your landscape. And the technology that we're starting to see at Microsoft, through Microsoft and, and with the releases at Ignite and, and the continuing trends is that we need to be prepared in enterprises to handle big scale security. Absolutely. And one, I mean, one trillion dollars in cybercrime. That is gigantic. Yep. And there's no way, a lot of stuff we're going to talk about kind of sets up for how we can help prevent that. Exactly. Working in the security space, we see stats like this literally every single day. So yeah, a trillion dollars lost to cybercrime. Uh, unfortunately to me, that washes over me, but you're right. It's a significant number. I think a really key thing on this slide here is the word confident in that 88% number. The fact that 88% of organizations are no longer confident, they can detect or, pre detect or prevent sensitive uh, loss of sensitive data. Um, I do see, and I'm sure you see this as well as we work with our customers, a lot of organizations don't have the confidence to feel that they've secured their environment sufficiently, right? And I think that leads to um, organizations not having, you know, A, the appropriate people in place or with the appropriate skill sets or the appropriate tools or the appropriate processes or really just the confidence that they're doing all of that in a, um, a well-planned, well-organized, secure and compliant way. And I think that's what this leads us to. And this comes out at Ignite for me every year where um, it is incredible how much Microsoft spends on this particular topic. 
right? Every Ignite, we see new security capabilities, new compliance capabilities coming to the platform. They don't rest on their laurels simply because last year they released a whole bunch of other new security capabilities. So we've seen a bunch more this year that help us to become more confident, to increase that confidence in our security. And I think when we talk about data, the one especially that's more near and dearest to almost like the audience we're in, which is around content. It's around mm -hmm. data. It's around actual files, right? We know there's a lot of, there's a lot of pre-existing capabilities for data loss for things like email yeah. uh, and things in transit like that. But one of the biggest growths we've seen and are continuously seeing is it's people who've been so consistent with, if it's on my network, it's okay, right? If it's on my file share, if it's in my share on-premise SharePoint site, it's safe. I trust it. Yeah. But how do we, what is the next step that if I want to share a file with a customer and I want to make sure that it, that customer and maybe only that customer can get to it, that other people can't, right? What is that? I think that was a great way to say confidence Yeah. because you are, I can be confident that if I send this file to you or I share this file with you, I'm confident it's not going to be stolen. There is no insider risk there. And I would say the sensitivity labels are the key to kind of move forward with that. So can you want to provide a little context around like what are sensitivity labels and why, why should we care? Sure. So, so we've seen this particular feature or term go through a number of different words or it's been renamed a couple of times through the platform. You might've heard this called Azure information protection in the past. You might've seen it talked about as sensitivity labels. Now we tend to talk about it as Microsoft information protection. And all those things are very much related, right? The, the product set here used to be called Azure Information Protection. It's now be re, been renamed by Microsoft to Microsoft Information Protection. And the thing that you are um, selecting for a file or a data object is a sensitivity label. Um, outside of the Microsoft space, this is also called data classification. So usually all those terms kind of refer to the same thing. A sensitivity label is something that you choose for a file that designates what the sensitivity of that content is to the organization. So in many classic cases, you would see sensitivity labels like um, public, internal only, confidential, secret, top secret, restricted. These are common sensitivity labels that you might choose from. So if I have a file, I'm gonna share it with somebody and I want them to handle it properly, I'm gonna choose a sensitivity label of confidential. And when I choose that sensitivity label, there's a number of things that happen. And sorry, just a side note, this is not just for files, this is also for emails, traditionally. There you go, yep. And we're gonna yep. see that it's coming to some new, um, some new data objects um, as well through some Ignite announcements that we heard. So when you choose a sensitivity yeah, and so, label, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I was gonna say, you choose it, right? And then what is, um, you choose it, and what are the big advantages that you see with kind of the stuff that's coming for in Office 365, right? What is that yeah. productivity experience that that this is dip, that this is really gaining from us that from it was even a year ago? Because again, yeah. this is a very new for a lot of people still. It is. So when you choose a sensitive label for a file or an email, there's three things that can happen, at least three core things. First of all, that sensitivity label is stored inside the data objects so the document or the email as metadata. That way the sensitivity of it travels with the document. Second, content markings are applied to the document. So as you can see in the screenshot here, you have the word confidential that is plastered across as a watermark across that presentation. Um, those markings can be headers, footers, or watermarks. And then finally, and optionally, you can encrypt the document and you encrypt it for a person or a group of people. That way, whoever receives it, if it's been encrypted for them, they can open it. But if it has not been encrypted or in quotes protected for them, they won't be able to open it. So that's kind of the core functionality of sensitivity labels. And some of the new things that we saw coming at Ignite were um, removing some of the blockers to rolling out MIP. So traditionally, the blockers have been things like, um, if I protect a PDF file in the past, so if I apply that encryption to a PDF file, um, in the past, I couldn't open it. And this is not Ignite this year, so I'm getting to a point here. Um, if I protected a PDF file and I sent it to somebody, I can no longer open it in the Adobe Acrobat Reader, right? A year ago at Ignite last year, they announced that Adobe had finally, after years of collaboration, uh, enabled the Adobe Acrobat Reader to actually open and read that in protected PDF file. So no longer did we have to go to third-party PDF readers, which was a pain. So that's one blocker, but Microsoft didn't stop there. This year at Ignite, they announced that the new Microsoft Edge browser is going to natively support opening PDF files 
and it's going to natively support opening um, protected PDF files. So you've got another way to easily get at those protected PDF files if it's been encrypted for you. So that's one of the key blockers. And a second key blocker was if you protected a file with MIP, with sensitivity labels, and then you uploaded that to SharePoint, for example, or OneDrive, SharePoint and OneDrive could no longer reason over it, right? The content was protected. So SharePoint and OneDrive couldn't decrypt it. So things like search didn't work, DLP didn't work, and e-discovery didn't work on those particular files. And now, and this to me is one of the most significant announcements, Microsoft has announced that um, they have unblocked that use case, that now um, you will be able to perform e-discovery on protected PDF files in SharePoint and OneDrive, um, and emails in Outlook or in Exchange. Um, DLP will work, and search will actually work on those protected files as well. So really, we're getting to a point where we should start to see mass um, adoption and rollout of Microsoft Information Protection and Sensitivity. I, and I would agree. So what, what I've, this was one of the ones I know, and I wanted to start with this one. There's a lot to talk about security and compliance, but if we're going to talk about a tsunami of things hitting for the people, everyone kind of listening here, this is one that if you're not experienced with it yet, or you're not ready, or you haven't really learned about it yet, take the time after this webinar to go really dive into sensitivity labels because this is going to be the, the future for how you really build that confidence to protect your files exactly. and to protect your content, your data, your, um, and the, the unblocking that this is happening. This is in preview right now. I want to make sure we're, we're clear with that too. So they opened up the preview. Yeah. Uh, they're definitely looking to get some feedback as far as this. I, I actually have enabled this and tested it out. Um, the co-authoring is great. Like, it's fun actually being able to classify something and have it work yeah. <laughs> in the browser. Um, exactly. So really, really big announcement that, that came. And I really like the concept that you talked about with Edge because um, from a timing standpoint, Edge, the Edge browser, uh, the new Edge Chrome browser is going to be released next January. Yeah. And yeah. if you kind of look at um, the concept of labeling, one of the gaps you have is if I labeled something with a sensitivity label, I couldn't do it everywhere. Like I, it just, the end user experiences, I could do it on mobile, I could do it in some browser, I could do it in the client. But what's coming is actually having those the, the labeling across your different platforms. That's so, right. and, so Antonio, what do you think this would really open up to people and why is this a, a big announcement that the labeling capability is coming for everyone? So I think this makes it so that there's no more excuses to not label a document, right? To not apply a sensitivity label or not to know that the document is sensitive. Like when you're rolling out a solution like this to an organization, there's a lot of work that's done, right? It's not simply something you turn on and everyone just starts using it. There's education programs, there's rolling out updates to clients so that everyone can actually access and use these labels. Um, so this really means that you can now label from say your, the word, uh, sorry, the, the um, web-based versions of Outlook, Excel, sorry, Outlook, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, um, as well as the mobile versions of those clients, as well as the Mac versions of the clients, you could do that for a while. Um, and then the new Edge browser as well, as we talked about. And I'd like to, as, we, as we're kind of jumping in here, I want to see this stuff too. So yeah. when we're talking about the sensitivity labels, I would say well, well, a big takeaway too, not just saying you need to learn about it, when I've worked with customers on helping implement labeling concepts, the technology actually has been usually the easier thing to talk with to, to talk about. The yeah. harder part is what are those labels actually going to be and how do we educate the people in our company about what, when to use them, what they mean, and what will happen if they do classify something with a sensitivity label. So that the building an information classification guideline, if you don't have one, is usually the first step to getting started with moving to sensitivity labels. Exactly. And there's, there's a couple aspects to that education that we're talking about is you do need to use to, to educate your users on um, which sensitivity label to choose in which circumstance, so which ones apply to which kinds of content in which circumstances, but then also when you receive a piece of content that's marked as confidential, um, how should you handle it? What are the company or the organization's acceptable policies for actually dealing with confidential information? Who can I share it with? Can I share it externally? Can I not? And so on. Um, the other thing to mention here before we go into a little demo is uh, Microsoft is also bringing sensitivity labels to some other containers or objects within the Microsoft Cloud space. So you're gonna be able to label Microsoft Teams, Office 365 Groups, SharePoint Sites, um, and um, Power BI Artifacts as well. So those labels are not just applying at the document level or the email level, but also these other containers that you can more readily use them across all of your content. 
and and I love and this was a really really good one too that uh, if anyone's con seen what they consider the Office 365 group classifications today you you actually set them up in Azure AD and you can mm -hmm. classify things but those are kind of just dummy objects right now they're just textual values they wouldn't necessarily say if I created a team and I marked it as highly sensitive that it does something right it's just more of a, a flag but the transition to unified sensitivity labels across files and containers you're actually we're going to start seeing the ability to add logic to it right so if i create a team and maybe a market is highly sensitive i can do certain things because of that right? Right. you can actually start putting policies in place to say if this team is highly sensitive or if it contains highly sensitive information maybe we we set a conditional access policy in there to say it's web only exactly. or maybe you can't access that one across outside of a outside of a certain network as an example exactly or, or we we require mfa no matter what at all times to that location yeah so we're, we're seeing those filter into the policy level as well where one of the announcements was that i can now configure a dlp policy that actually takes a sensitivity label into account when determining if content is sensitive or not and thereby um, um, restricting access to it or enforcing policies on it Awesome. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing every second so you can kind of take over. And as I'm stopping over, I'm gonna talk a little bit about timing on this. So I'm stopping now for you, Antonio. Uh, the, the, one of the shifts as far as timing for these, so the, both of the things we're talking about, these core ones as far as uh, sensitivity labels being available, being viewable in SharePoint, kind of being smarter in SharePoint, that's in preview. You can enable that through PowerShell today. Uh, the labels for sites and groups is also in preview. Um, we'll have some slide, a slide on that at the end. I'm going to talk about it. So it, those things are all kind of coming, but there are things today with sensitivity labels that you, you can do, and I'll let you kind of take over, Antonio. All right, great. Are you able to see my screen, Drew? Yep. Okay, great. So I was going to do a really quick demo just of the configuration of labels here and show you some of the changes in the Microsoft Security and Compliance Centers. So here I've got my Microsoft 365 Admin Center. And um, if we go down here to admin centers, you can see that I've got a security center and a compliance center. So traditionally, we're used to seeing here security and compliance center. And about a year ago, Microsoft split these into two separate consoles. And over the last year, we've seen those consoles evolve um, quite differently. We've seen new features introduced to them and menu items and options move around and Microsoft kind of playing with the UI a little bit. Um, Important to note, depending on the license you have, you may still see security and compliance as one item, or you'll see security and compliance as two separate items. Here I have Microsoft 365 licenses, so I get both of these consoles. Whereas if you have an Office 365 license, which is a different license from a Microsoft 365 license, you'll tend to see just one. So I can go to the, I'm going to go to the compliance center here. And sensitivity labels, as we've been talking about, you can actually configure those in both the Compliance Center and the Security Center. So I'm going to show you the Compliance Center first. So this is the Compliance Center, and I'm just on the home page of it. Um, the home right now is, is fairly simple. This is a fairly clean tenant that I have. We've got this new concept of the Compliance Score, which is fantastic. Um, we can talk about that if we've got some time left. But one thing I wanted to show you, and, and this is important to note because even the, the screenshots or UI that we saw at Ignite um, is still a little, is already a little bit out of date. Um, we've seen now and, and we've got an indication that Microsoft is starting to settle on their UI in this compliance center. Um, one interesting thing that we see now is this catalog. Now the catalog will actually show you the different either information protection or information governance solutions that are available in here. So things like data loss prevention, information governance, records management, information protection, um, new feature we're going to talk about in a second, communication compliance, and so on. And what you can do is you can click view and actually go to the console for these particular items. And then I can pin those items to the left side here. So um, if I click on information protection, That'll take me to a home page and a console for that. I get some great information about the console. Um, and then when I want to show it in the navigation, you see how it appears there on the side. Now, if I click on it here, or when I was back in here, I can also just, um, under information protection, I could just click open solution. They take me to the same places. Here's where I configure my sensitivity labels. And you can see those here now. Um, so I've got um, one, two, three, four, five. I've got five sensitivity labels here, public, internal only, confidential, restricted, highly restricted, and so on. Um, 
you know, I can, if I click on show all here, you'll see that I have a bunch of them already actually attached to the side. Here, I've already pinned them to the side, but that catalog is really going to be the place where we access these compliance solutions. If I go to that security center that you saw, and I already have a tab open to it, in here, the same area where I'm going to configure the sensitivity labels is available. It's just accessed a little bit differently. I would go to classification and I would go to sensitivity labels. And then I see the same sensitivity labels that I saw previously show up here. So whether I come to it through this console, or whether I come to it through this console here, information protection, I'm actually configuring the same thing. And just like before, and this is now what we call the unified um, labeling experience, if you will, um, sometimes it's referred to as that, um, I would first create a number of labels and I would go through a little wizard by clicking on create label. And then after I've created my label, and here's where I choose all my settings for a name for the label, a uh, tooltip for, um, the actual user who's going to use the label. And that tooltip is usually really descriptive to let the user know when they can use it. I then choose options for encryption, content marking. I can actually integrate it with data loss prevention on the endpoint, so on my desktop. Um, I can pick rules for automatically applying that label and so on. So once I go through that wizard and I create it, I now have a label. Then I need to publish that label. And I would publish that label to either um, users for their mailboxes, perhaps, or their OneDrive sites, or to SharePoint sites, um, and so on. So I'm sorry, I take that back. I would publish these sensitivity labels. I'm confusing this with retention labels. I would publish sensitivity labels to users or groups, and then they will show up in their Outlook or in their um, Office applications for applying to documents. Awesome. I'll turn it back to you, Drew, just in the uh, sense of time here. Great. Awesome. While we do the transition, I actually have a few questions uh, from the chat here. Uh, so first one is, who can set those labels on documents? Can, let's say as a user, do I upload a document and then I can set the label or how are those applied in general? So that's a great question. And it's important to remember that sensitivity labels can be applied to both documents and email today. As we said, they're gonna to come to other containers as well as you create a site or a team. But to answer the question specifically, when I create that label and then I publish it, I'm publishing it to users or groups. So it is the end user in many cases who is selecting those labels. And they would actually select the label in Microsoft Outlook or in Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. Um, the slide we had earlier about um, these labels coming to many other clients, especially on mobile devices, it means you'll be able to either select a label in the uh, mobile version of Outlook or the mobile version of Office, or you'll be able to see what a label is on an email you receive or a document you receive in those applications. So it is the end user generally selecting the sensitivity label. However, when you publish a label, you can also choose automated rules or conditions that will also apply those sensitivity labels. So you can actually have sensitivity labels automatically applied to email or to documents based on the content of the email or the content within attachments to email um, or the content of documents. So an example there is I can have a rule that looks through my email or my attachments for any sensitive data, like a social security number or a credit card number, a bank account number, and based on that, or based on keywords or phrases, automatically select the sensitivity label for me. Awesome. And a follow-up question on that. Uh, what is What license levels are required, first of all, to create those labels? Mm -hmm. And second of all, to actually apply them? And actually, this was the first question. And the second one was more specifically to the F1 users. So maybe just a bit from a licensing point of view in general, what is required to create and what is required to apply? Sure, so a bit of a disclaimer first, I'm not a Microsoft licensing <laughs> However, I'll share with you what I know. So um, to actually um, apply labels and create them, it would be the same license for both. Um, it is available, that solution is available with a number of licenses. One of them is you can actually buy um, an AIP add-on license and there's a P1 and a P2 flavor. So depending on what license you already have, in Office 365 or Microsoft 365, you can actually buy the AIP P1 or P2 add-on license, and then you can use sensitivity labels and create them. Um, or if you purchase a Microsoft 365 E3 license, you do receive the MIP solution with it. And then again, you can uh, create and select labels. 
So if you have an F1 license today, you would need, I believe, and please double check with your Microsoft licensee expert, you would need at least the AIP P1 add-on license. And that allows you to both create them and select them. And to add on one more, Antonio, the next step up, uh, so some of the auto, anything that's auto classification yes. will require more. So that would be up stepping up to an E5 or the AIP P2 license to yep. do any of the auto classification. And I want to make sure, one of the other things they announced actually was a more fluent, I would process, I would say, for auto sense, for uh, auto classification. So we are seeing things shift to that route yep. uh, that will require further licensing, but the moral of the story is you can uh, publish these labels to employees. And I, th I think what I've seen, and actually it's a really cool idea when you publish to employees, is you can have, there's a reason to have different labels for different groups of people. Right? You could have board members that have very specific security requirements or salespeople that need to expose things more externally versus someone maybe on the product or on, on shop floor, It's they'll just have standard requirements. So very cool thing to to dive into and we, we, that's fun. We spent, we got through a half hour without a licensing question. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, we talk right, we, a lot about security. Let's, let's I want to jump into uh, more around some of the trends and risk, right? So the, the concept of risk is a very important one, especially in highly regulated industries. And the, the trend of not just knowing, having confidence of your files being secure, it's, what do you, where is this insider risk coming from and what is, how is Microsoft tooling able to help with us? So Antonio, this is, I know this is one of the larger announcements, I think from the security and compliance team. Yep. So you want to speak a little bit about what you've seen from insider risk and how uh, the uh, Microsoft announcements are going to, to help us here. Absolutely. So um, insider risk comes from a number, number of areas and it, it very much fits with the theme of security and compliance. Right, insider risk both poses security issues and issues towards you know you complying with the regulations that are pertinent to your business. Um, insider risk can come from a couple of, a couple of areas. Often it comes from um, your own employees um, stealing data, so or taking data, especially and this typically happens when employees leave an organization. Right, you you have many many instances where when an employee leaves an organization, either um, voluntary or not. Um, they take data with them and it's often sensitive data, right? It could be source code, it could be customer lists, it could be specifications on products, and there's many reasons why employees might do that. Um, another area where it comes from is um, employees, you know, maliciously leaking data. Um, but what's more common than both of those is employees accidentally leaking data. We find that the inadvertent data leak or accidental data leak tends to um, far outweigh that like the number of instances it happens far outweighs um, the other scenarios of people stealing data or people maliciously leaking data but all three represent insider risks and again we've got some stats here where you know 90 percent of enterprises feel that they're vulnerable to insider risk so they don't have solutions in place that help either um, detect or prevent or mitigate that um, we see 57% indicate that they're uh, most vulnerable to loss of confidential data. Um, and then 51% are concerned about inadvertent insider behaviors. So people not knowing how to deal with sensitive data, right? No, not understanding that the spe specification they're, they're reading right now is confidential and they're not allowed to email it to a personal email address for say work at home or elsewhere. Yeah, and when we bring that into the bigger picture, I like this concept of big data and, and the importance of mass scale, right? It's how can we have an investigation to know this is happening, right? How can we track these activities? We There are so many activities happening yeah. that the tool now uh, called Insider Risk Management is going to help us aggregate that information into a more centralized source to try to prevent this, and if not prevent it, perform investigations based on potential. That's right. right. So, so what are some of those investigation actions you might see? Like, what are some of the key things you see that this is going to bring to the table? And um, I guess speak to this is a release, right? This this was announced right. two weeks ago. So this is a brand new feature. We're going to see it's not rolled out to our tenants yet. So the tenant I was just demoing from doesn't have it yet. But there's a brand new console that Microsoft is releasing to the Microsoft Compliance Center for insider risk management. And it's actually called the insider risk management feature um, or um, center, if you will, um, using a combination of monitoring user activities 
and machine learning around what is risky and what's not in the organization, which users are performing risky actions or not. The Insider Risk Management Console is actually going to surface data about where um, risky behavior is occurring within your organization. And you're going to be able to issue alerts based on those items happening, and then actually be able to trace and follow the actions that particular users are performing. So some of those actions are things like if um, the system notices that people, you know, a particular user is starting to copy data to um, a USB drive, or if someone is emailing data to a personal email address or an external email address, right? And as these activities happen, you're going to be able to see these show up in your console. These, so these will show up as risky behavior. And then you'll be able to correlate activities together over a timeline. So you'll be able to watch if, you know, as you're leading up to a particular timeline, perhaps when an employee announces that they're leaving the organization, you're going to be able to watch risky behavior happening. Like perhaps on one day, someone starts sending a bunch of emails to their personal email address, or someone starts copying files to a USB drive that's attached, or um, other risky similar behaviors. Um, it's going to monitor for that data, both on the endpoints, so on the user desktops, as well as in the Microsoft 365 platform, and across the different services, whether it's email, SharePoint, OneDrive, your Windows 10 desktop, Microsoft Teams, so it'll actually monitor conversations in Teams as well. Um, and as it pulls all that data together, it's actually going to allow you to do a couple things. Focus your attention on the specific activities that are risky. So you don't have to go through an entire team's thread to find where some risky behavior is happening, for example. Um, it will also allow you to anonymize that data because there's many organizations out there where they have policies or um, confidentiality data privacy policies, whether they're from re regulatory industry, you know, regulatory frameworks or not, around who's allowed to see an employee's personal data or private data. Um, so for the investigator, the person in the organization that's actually watching this console, you can actually have that data anonymized. So I can't actually see the data, but I can see that Vlad, for example, is performing some risky behavior um, in the organization. I could follow that. And then it's at a point where um, someone needs to investigate it further. Let's say we want to hand that off to legal or to our HR team. We'll actually be able to package that up. And there's, there's a playbook or a workflow in there where I can then hand that off to the, the HR team or the legal team for further investigation. And, and that's awesome. I think what I've seen, and especially in the OneDrive space, is I've actually helped custom, custom, customers set up a big one, which is a mass download, right? Mm -hmm. what it, when, when do we alert on mass download and how do we track a mass download? And can you correlate that to another action that's occurring? I mean, a product release, an employee leaving yeah. the company? Very, yeah. so that was kind of the start to have those alerts. This is enhancing those alerts and bringing that really to add context to it, right? It's, it was very hard to take an alert and say, I don't, yeah, I mean, maybe Antonio did need to download 50 files today, yeah. right? It, I didn't really have context there. Well, this should hopefully provide more context and actionable items into it. That's awesome. That's exactly it. Like we've been able to have, you know, alerts and policies around mass download for a long time, right? You used to be used, you could use cloud app security to alert you to, oh, someone has downloaded 50 gigabytes of data on a Sunday um, and have an alert automatically issued. But to be able to correlate that across the timeline to other risky behavior and ultimately to some sort of a, you know, uh, um, an event, um, that's what this concept, this console really gives you. Awesome. And now let's pivot a little bit into compliance, right? So I want to, we're talking about risk. Uh, part of risk is being able to support different regulatory or actionable items that need to be performed. So I think the, the key for this one, I'd like to start with this one is if you're familiar with supervision or the supervision aspects inside of Office 365 is, which would be, hey, I need to take an act because of some type of violation or take some action because of a regulatory need. It could mm -hmm. be, I need to monitor 10% of our emails for certain users to be able to confirm we meet compliance uh, standards. So they, uh, supervision was a, a, a key aspect of that. Uh, the supervision engine is being brought up a little bit. I would say it's starting to cover a little bit more than just supervision. And it's also gotten a rename into communication compliance. Correct. So, so uh, Antonio, what, were, what would you see that, Know, knowing that supervision has been around for a while, we've had supervision, uh, yeah. what do you see in the shift to communication compliance and why is that important for us to know versus just supervision? 
So this is a great enhancement to supervision. Um, the, the solution here, so supervision would allow you to monitor people's um, communications throughout an organization and you could, you know, you can create a case and you could actually monitor the communication. You could choose how, how much of a person's communication you want to monitor. Um, and that was helpful, but what communication compliance really does, it again allows us to bring more context into those communications. It allows us to use machine learning to understand what is um, inappropriate communication or not, right? Because inappropriate communication is not, it's not simply comparing communication or keywords to, you know, a dictionary of bad words or inappropriate language. It's really about context and being able to bring that in. So be able to take words that, you know, when, when put into a certain context really are perhaps harassment or a violation of corporate policy or a violation of a regulatory standard. So what this does, it incorporates machine learning and um, context across the timeline um, into the whole supervision feature. Um, and it allows you to um, not only supervise communications or monitor communications, but focus the communications really on the pieces of that communication thread that relate to some sort of a case that you're investigating. So again, instead of having to go through an entire team conversation that could be very, very long with hundreds of contributions, this allows you to actually focus in on the very specific communications that are perhaps violating a policy or that are related to some sort of harassment. And I would say a big announcement they threw on this too, it's, it's the last line in that second bullet and that second line there, which is third party content. Yes. We're, we're talking about Microsoft specific content, but we know that, and I think one of the big trends in, in all of Ignite's for the past couple of years is we know Microsoft does not just rule the world. It's not just Microsoft. So there are other solutions that are, are really required. I think a great example could be Bloomberg in the financial space yeah. that that data also needs to be brought. How else can you bring that data into a single engine that you can start to take action on and not Absolutely. just the teams and exchange pieces. So they did announce that third party content connectors are available to be brought or will be available to be brought into this solution. Yep, exactly. We've seen a couple of announcements over the last year around that, but there's a few key ones that have come out now where third party content like Bloomberg data, I believe, you know, Dropbox and Box data can also be brought in some social media you'd be able to bring in as well. So you can actually archive that content that's related to you in your Microsoft 365 tenant. And then not only can this operate on it, but other um, artifacts as well will be able to operate on it in the future, things like e-discovery and so on. And hey, before we move forward, sorry, I actually have two questions. Sure. Uh, one of them is mine. Wait, there's a world outside Microsoft? There's there's other tools out there? I, I don't believe it. In the security space, there's a ton. It's great, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the second more serious one, and I'm not sure, this is relating a bit to a third party, so I, I'm not sure how much you guys are aware of it, uh, but somebody asked, so does the, of course, the previous slide uh, replace or augment a product like Veronis? And I think they're talking a lot about the auto remediation. Oh my yeah. God, that's hard in English. Remediation workflows, yeah. uh, kind of that Veronis has. So I would say today, so I'm very familiar with the Veronis solution, um, solutions. Um, <laughs> they, uh, today I believe this augments the Veronis solutions, but where I think this is heading is this will ultimately very much replace the Veronis solutions. Uh, many of those out there, uh, many of the solutions from Veronis were about monitoring activities that would occur on network file shares, on SharePoint sites, exchange servers. Um, they did bring those solutions to the cloud um, to allow you to issue reports and alerts um, based on what happens in those. Um, but this is heading towards allowing you to do everything that Veronis does and more. Okay, and I think this is actually something just as a general comment. We've seen Microsoft trying to close the gaps on a lot of solutions, whether it's, I mean, I work for Valo, we see it in the intranet space, uh, where whatever you work, whatever third party, uh, Microsoft is trying to close the gaps. And I, I think it's up to the vendors where it's Valo for intranet, Veronis for security, and any, any other vendor out there to keep uh, investing and keep adding value on mm. top of Microsoft in order to stay alive. So maybe, and again, I'm, I don't want to speak for Veronis, even if I know they're great guys, uh, but I think like any vendor, Microsoft will reach 
where they are at today and they need to keep investing that hopefully when Microsoft reaches that point, they're already going to be one or two years ahead to keep adding value to their customers. Absolutely. No, that's a great point, Vlad. Um, the slide that you have here, um, Drew, this is really pointing to these solutions we've been talking about. So um, insider risk management, communication compliance, it's really about helping you mitigate risks related to these well, mitigate these particular risks. So things like, you know, data leaks, data spillage, um, stealing IP or stealing sensitive data, and so on. Communication compliance is about, you know, policy violations, conflicts of interest, investigating workplace harassment, and so on. There are very strict regulations around um, monitoring and supervising communications, things like FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, had some specific regulations around um, uh, supervision that this really helps you to meet. And I think one of the fun, most important things from this, like I feel like I'm saying that again, but what do we do when we talk to a, when we talk to a customer for the first time, as far as how you can even the initial starting point for preventing almost a ton of that, which is how many global admins do you have, right? Yeah. How many global administrators do you have in your tenants? I've seen some fantastic numbers yeah. Right. If you want to stop some of those initial, the, uh, the initial ability for data leakage, yeah. uh, stop giving just because someone needs to have access. Yeah. Don't just grant them GA. Yeah. And this was a very helpful addition that uh, we have global reader now. So what is global reader, Antonio? So you bring up a great point. The worst I've ever seen was an organization that I did a security audit on that had 40 global administrators. And I had to tell them, you should bring that down to four. So an order of magnitude lower. Um, Global Reader allowed 40. 40. Yeah. 40. Woo. Yeah, that was the worst I've ever seen. At um, 28. Uh, at 20, 20. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, so Global Reader is a new, um, a new role in the administration, in the uh, Microsoft 365 Admin Center that allows a person to log in and actually see the configuration, actually view and see the configuration. They can read it, but they can't change any of the configuration there. So there have been legitimately roles within an organization that need to manage or, or review or monitor some aspects of the Office 365 Admin Center. And traditionally, those people couldn't get at that unless they had global admin access. So some organizations just resorted to, well, we're gonna give this person global admin access because we don't have an option. Global Reader allows you to now give someone read-only access to the admin center and prevent them from actually able to change or edit anything. And if we go through here, not only did they add Global Reader, but they added a number more. I think there's 34 different roles now. I could be wrong in that number, um, but I think there's 34 different roles in the admin center now. So there's some of the traditional collaboration ones that you see here. If we go to the next one, we now have um, roles for just managing devices. So if you want someone who whose responsibility is just to manage Intune. We now have an Intune admin role. If you go to the next one, Drew, we have roles now to manage identity. So if you have someone whose job it is to just manage um, guest users, right? As you're doing external sharing to guest users, you have someone whose role it is to, okay, I'm gonna add some more guest users. Or I'm someone who just manages the privileged identities. So my administrators. I now have specific roles for those that you can see listed here. And then if we and what I wanted to highlight here, Antonio, I, I really like this one because this has come up multiple times that I've seen, and I think this is a really important one: is the conditional access admin. Yeah. Uh, where what you really, really need to be careful of when you think about initial entry for security and compliance, what is the one of the first lines of defense? It's identity, right? It's your identity is who you are, and getting into a source system is that, and and moving to the zero trust model and how we think of every uh, assume risk with zero trust that where we see administrators come into play and why this type of reader role and the break apart this is, is so important is someone can make a conditional access change. Yep. And if you make that change, you could l legitimately be exposing something or shatter something within seconds. That's I right. mean, it is a, these types of roles have an incredible amount of power inside of them. And the CA one, the conditional access one is one that really can, can shut down a company. Yep. I mean, you could say, oh, I want to test MFA. Yep. And you flip on MFA. And then all of a sudden you have 50,000 employees that now have to register their device, register an app and, and move forward with MFA. And you're just like, well, I just, just testing it as an example. <laughs> like yeah. I've heard those scenarios happening. And, and so I think the break apart of these and, and continue down, like, there's just so many of these, aren't there? 
Yeah, there is. Like I said, I think they've, they've introduced a number. Traditionally, we had like 10 admin roles. And now I think we have, it's either 28 or 34. It's in that range. I don't remember the exact number, but you'll see there the security and compliance one. We have an AIP or an Azure Information Protection admin, a compliance admin, compliance data admin, and so on. So the fact that we can get much more granular in the admin center is fantastic. So that was new at Ignite. Now, what about, uh, I think you led into one good question with FINRA, right? FINRA, I think, is a, a very, I won't say popular, but it's a very important regulation to be aware of. And one of the type, and this is not just FINRA, obviously, but in regulated scenarios, there could be places and reasons and there are, I should not be able to talk to someone else Correct. within my t within my own company, right? You and I both work at Creativity. You could be in a space that, uh, from a broker trader aspect, that you actually um, I should not be able to communicate with you or share files with you because that could be a breach. There, there, you could assume breach. So uh, information barriers are something that a lot of times it's been logical. It's like, hey, you shouldn't talk to Frank, like whatever. But yep. w now we're starting to see technology come into play. So what, how is information barriers going to meet that need and why is this important? Yeah, so I've seen this scenario in a couple of instances. The traditional one is in the financial sector. So FINRA has rules 2241 and 2242 that prevent analysts from being able to share information from traders or people that are trading in securities, right? That is a, a very standard scenario we hear about where if your organization is both um, analyzing products or releasing products as well as trading in those products, you have to, uh, from a financial regulatory standpoint, keep a separation of sharing information between them. Another one is where you have organizations that deal in legal cases, and perhaps that organization gets hired to represent both sides of a legal case. So they have to have a strict barrier between the information they share to protect client confidentiality and impartiality. Um, information barriers, it's actually been in preview for a while for teams where, you know, two different groups cannot both be members of the same team, so they can't both see the same conversation. But what we did here at Ignite was this is also going to extend now to SharePoint sites. So if I can't share a SharePoint site with someone who there's a barrier preventing me from communicating with them. And I think that's really cool. So you can be in, so to break this thing up, like what's information barriers that have been preview in Teams. So like I could not be in Teams and message someone else outside of the scope. So you basically build a, a group of people. Yep. What's coming now is going to be if I have a file and I try to share it with someone, it, yep. that won't be able to work. Correct. I can't, I can't actually, if I am have this file and I'm not supposed to talk to you, Antonio, and I tried to share a file with you, that, that we have that same sharing dialogue everywhere, that yep. will not work. Across. Exactly. That's great. Um, now, what about resident? Where we're staying in the compliance room. What about uh, residency? And what it looks like we have some new data centers. We do. We have some great new data centers. So there's new data centers being lit up in South Africa. We all have a great friend in South Africa, or a couple of great friends in South Africa with Tracy and Alistair. So big shout out to them. A new data center coming to South Africa, which is great. Um, United Arab Emirates, the UAE, and then India as well. And when we say data center, right, these are, there's actually going to be two data centers in each one of these. There's also a, always a primary and disaster recovery data center as well. So this allows you, um, you know, we already have, I think, 154 data center regions across the world, allowing you to maintain your data resident in country, if that's a regulation you have. This is now extending to more regions. Awesome. That's great. Now, let's talk about, and this is kind of wrap this up now with our time. So we have, there was a lot of announcements that was, or we hit, I, we hit what we thought were some of the key ones. Yeah. Uh, in general, these slides will all be available for everyone after, for everyone that attended, and, and these will be available online. I would say we hit most of these. I, I think, don't think we missed any of them, actually. I think we got uh, CAD, all these. CAD the artifacts. Time. There we go. We can do CAD as well. So if anyone's doing some Autodesk work. But we hit the key ones here were automatic labeling, uh, the native labeling across the, all the Office applications, and really that key ability that when I upload content into uh, Office 365 uh, that in SharePoint OneDrive that they are viewable. Correct. Now, as far as some of the previews to kind of break this down timing a little bit more. So soon, that means, well, caveat soon is kind of this year is yeah. the way it's kind of phrased. So the previews for the majority of the things we talked about are available. And if you actually follow the link at the bottom of ODSP security previews, uh, you can actually sign up for some pr potential private previews for some of these as well. Uh, if you uh, follow the bottom link, it should take you down to the areas for how to enable your tenant for these, pro for these public preview capabilities. Uh, it is a PowerShell commandlet to turn these on. 
And there is some other work that you're going to want to look at for how how you really start working with some of those labels and some of the new the new policies. As far as uh, and information barriers again are also still in, in private preview for the SharePoint work that we're talking about. I, I think what's kind of we'll see some of the stuff early next year that we did hit on. Uh, what's going to be kind of cool for top of the mind. Uh, I really like kind of talking about more about conditional access, right? It's going to be site level conditional access. That's how cool is that? How cool could that be? Uh, and then you, Office 365 Unified Instant Access Revocation. We're, we're talking about much more control around objects inside of SharePoint and OneDrive to when users come in or out or internal or external to get fully control of that. So to kind of bring this back up so you can become confident with your data. If I can add one point to that, that top bullet on top of mind, granular conditional access at the site level. So conditional access is a fantastic feature. What's even more awesome is you can use conditional access to actually hand off the policy evaluation to Microsoft Cloud App Security, which has a lot more granular capabilities for policy evaluation. And this whole bit here, it's gonna allow you to do that whole handoff differently for different sites in SharePoint. So you're gonna be able to, and, and actually that's not only sites, you'll be able to get down to the folder level with that as well, because I've been on the preview for that. And that's a, a pretty cool feature to be able to get that granular with those policies. Yeah, I think that's a really good, and you can actually do some conditional access on SharePoint sites now, mm -hmm. uh, but you cannot get uh, incredibly granular. And I think that's a good call back into the Cloud App Security route, that if you are in, uh, if you have the ability to take advantage of Microsoft Cloud App Security, the majority of the things we talked about here are actually going to be able to be enhanced yep. and actually take it to the next level. So if we're talking about auto classification or data and transfer or being able to actually manage applications outside of just some of the Microsoft stack and still having vision into all of that, the Microsoft Cloud App Security engine or the, the CASB solution can really start to bring some of these security compliance solutions to a higher level than just Microsoft. So uh, with that, I want to make sure we did touch on uh, Ignite the Tour. So we did talk about uh, a lot of different things here, and this is not going to stop. There was already one in Paris last week. Uh, there's actually going to be some up. I know Vlad's going to be up at the one in Toronto uh, presenting. Uh, and if you did not get to attend Microsoft Ignite, it, is, it did sell out pretty quick. That a lot of this information, the security and appliance things we're talking about, are going to be coming hopefully to a city near you. Now with that, uh, we did at the top of the hour, and of course with staying in line with the way we've been uh, moving forward, with, we can't have we can't have another recap webinar without swag, can we, Vlad? Yes, we can. Well, no, we cannot. We absolutely <laughs> have to give that away, and believe me, I've been highly encouraged at home to give away a lot of swag. So I can't wait to send it to you guys. And to keep the tradition, Antonio, uh, you're going to have to pick a number between 1 and 114. Wow. Okay. I will pick number 12. Okay. Number 12 is Tammy Schwark. I, I hope I said that right, but that is number 12 on the attendee list, and Tammy, we're going to reach out. Uh, oh, see, Tammy is online. She put in the chat, yay. So uh, I'll reach out soon to get the shipping address, and we'll get that shipped pretty soon. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. I heard that my voice, there's a problem a bit with my microphone, so I'm not going to talk too much. But we do have a few questions from the chat. Uh, Drew's telling me there, my audio is not really good. Uh, maybe, Drew, can you read the questions from the Q&A for people that want to stay a bit longer for that? Sure. Uh, so uh, talking about, we're going to bring back up a little bit and talking about connectors. So Antonio, has there, have you heard of any other connectors for any ERP systems coming into the security and compliance, kind of the Microsoft stack, um, potentially uh, loss in Infor? I have not heard of that one. I think that's something we can take away and maybe ask the product team about, but I haven't heard of that specific one. I have heard of connectors for things like ServiceNow, um, Bloomberg. Those are kind of some key ones that we've heard about. Um, so yeah, so and I would agree. I think a good takeaway is I'm, 
is it kind of the custom connector route. So this is a perfect example where they pick some, this is just coming out. So uh, as far as discussions for future connectors, the even the connection we're talking about now into the communication compliance piece are just being released right now. So, and there's the first wave of them. As we can, I think a good example could be when we talk about connectors in the power platform, right? When the power platform was originally released, the connector list was, was quite low, um, but, to be able to do business and the way to continue and to kind of continue on with uh, with Vlad's conversation about partners and yours is you, these customers will need to evolve into it and the ability to build custom actions in there, I know those discussions are occurring. So similar to how the Power Platform can do custom connectors like your own applications, how do we get data in? Microsoft wants to have their, wants to be able to be that solution provider to give you analyzing and work against your data. So as far as specific applications, it's usually keep your ear to the ground on this one, and then look at when the potential for uh, custom connectors are coming in. The other thing I like to talk about with partners on this is push the partners. But they were they they have access; they can get access to some of these things. When you talk about someone like Bloomberg, they they don't just come out of nowhere. That it's going to be an aspect to Microsoft saying, "Hey, we want to ingest our information in here too." So a lot of kind of give and take that goes back with bringing custom connectors in. Another question around, who is a good one, uh, custom roles in Azure AD, custom admin roles. I've not yet seen the ability to create custom admin roles. We've been asking for that for a long time. I, did you see anything in that regard, Drew? I did not see anything at Ignite for that one either. No, um, I mean, that's something the product team has been thinking about for a long time. It's harder to build than I think a lot of us realize. Um, their first ability, like like the first, I think, um, enhanced abilities for that are these new roles that we're seeing come out, but they're not that customizable yet. Yeah, I, I agree to on that one too. Uh, as far as uh, my kind of last question here is uh, kind of almost more feedback around delegated admins and being able to, even though you, let SharePoint admin as an example, they might only need to see parts of it, parts of SharePoint, uh, when you're kind of working with customers, what is kind of the process you have to help talk, talk through who needs to have the right access and how do you really build that delegated access per, uh, idea? That's, that's a great point. So we see delegated access typically at the site owner level where an organization wants businesses to, you know, business users to manage and own their own sites. And being a site owner is fine. We often recommend that, you know, people are required to go through some short training course to understand what it means to be a site owner so that they understand the responsibilities and the things they should do and they shouldn't do. I think where we run into some challenges is where those site owners are made site collection admins as well, um, which is a little bit different. And if you're a group owner, you're automatically a site collection admin, as you know, that sometimes prevents some challenges because there's a lot of, you know, you have a lot of capabilities at the site collection admin level that perhaps business users don't need to have. So that's, that's typically the most risky area that we see. Have you, have you seen any in this regard, Drew? Yeah, from the SharePoint side, I feel like I've been pretty good about kind of breaking down what you have. Um, I would say the, the process I've seen is really doing and uh, kind of building a reportable analysis, reportable, like a report for all of your administrative roles yeah. and actually having that, taking that outside of the application, right? And putting that into something that people can sign off on and having that kind of go through a committee or go through a team and having that be brought up into specific meetings. And you actually say you are being delegated in these roles. So like the work that we do, like we put that in our governance training, our governance platform, yep. say, let's talk through, we have to talk with you. We have to figure this out, right? There's not a, a this person should be in this role. It's how did, how do we massage into our roles and responsibilities from an on-premises world into a new one? And Azure AD and the, the security space is probably the one that hits people the most. I like, I'll say again on that conditional access one, who owns conditional access? Is it, de is it a desktop management team? Is it the Azure AD team? Is it, is it security? Team? Yeah. It's, I mean, that's going to be managed for how you ac how you onboard a new uh, Windows 10 device, right? How, how BYOD is going to work is affected through it. So a lot of overlap in there and it's, it takes time and an understanding. And I usually approach it from a committee aspect and uh, an agreement that these are the applications you're gonna own. Yeah. All right, time for one more here, uh, Antonio, before we kind of drop. Uh, if we've already implemented another solution, let's say semantic DLP, uh, can you still implement MIP? 
You can, you absolutely can. So with many of the traditional or on-premise DLP solutions, even other cloud DLP solutions, they typically have the ability to read metadata within emails and files, right? So metadata within files is usually in the form of file properties. Metadata within emails is usually in the form of X headers. And you know, going all the way back to, if you've ever used Cisco Ironport devices, even those had the ability to read that metadata out of files or emails. So absolutely, if you deploy MIP to your organization, people are uh, you know, tagging and labeling documents for sensitivity, your semantic DLP definitely should be able to read that, that metadata within those documents and emails and then enforce policy on them. Oh, and, that, and I would agree, and that's what I've seen as well. So Microsoft does have a lot of platform capabilities in here. We've seen, we've seen a lot of the different announcements outside of this, uh, and I'm excited to see this continue to continue to grow. So Antonio, uh, thank you very much for joining us on the, our last Ignite recap here. Uh, for everyone attended, thank you very much. We, we will be sending the, the recap of the video and the slides available for everyone. And of course, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to Vlad, Antonio, and myself across uh, different social networks would probably be the quickest way, but always feel free to, if you see us at the next Ignite the Tour or the next event, uh, come say hi and we can love to talk compliance with you. And thanks so, so much for having me guys. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Have a great day.